Hello everyone. Welcome to Global Compliance Panel live webinar on statistical process control for attribute data. My name is Johnson and I'm going to be a host today. On behalf of the Global Compliance Panel team, I would like to thank you for being a part of today's event. Today's webinar will be presented by Dr. Stephen S. Kohara. Dr. Kuhara is the founder and principal of GXP Biotechnology LLC, a consulting firm that works in the areas covered by the GLP and GMP of drugs, biologics, and nutraceuticals. Dr. Kuhara has over 30 years of experience in supervising quality laboratories, including an animal testing facility, and in performing GLP and GMP audits of internal and external testing laboratories. Dr. Kuhara has participated in the development of drugs and biologicals through all phases of clinical research and final product pr production. We are honored to have such a distinguished person such as Dr. Kuhara with us to present today's webinar. Before we begin, I would like to inform you of the program outlined for today's training session. This webinar is for 90 minutes duration. First, Dr. Kuara will take you through today's webinar highlighting the areas that will be covered and he would then share with you his presentation. We'd like to inform all our participants once part of the teleconference have been placed on mute and will remain so until the Q&A window begins towards the end of the webinar. We also request all to hold back your questions until the Q&A window begins. Ten minutes of time will be allotted for the Q&A where your questions will be answered. If for any reason you do get logged out of this training session or teleconference, please follow the same procedure to join in again. Now that we are all ready to start, I request Dr. Kuhara to take it from here. Doctor? Okay. Thank you very much, Johnson. Um, today's webinar is going to cover, well, basically statistical process control. And uh, we're going to concentrate on attribute data. And as you will see, there are certain characteristics of attribute data which make it necessary to use slightly different uh, plotting mechanisms and uh, different considerations for calculating your limits and uh, you know the uh, the way in which you would do your plotting now the thing is, is that the initial question that comes up is that, you know, what should you monitor by statistical process control? And basically, it's, um, well, first of all, people are going to tell you, well, you need to uh, monitor GMP processes. Well, you know, not all GMP processes need to be monitored. And uh, basically, what you're looking at are the processes that introduce variability into the uh, system and um, you know this can also be things like test methods and um, your annual product reviews uh, need to look at your batch records to see if they're being properly executed if there are any problems actually you know um, most people monitor the batch records uh, on a lot by lot basis rather than uh, do it what, during the annual product review because you know sometimes that can generate a lot of work. And then uh, any process that generates critical business information, you see, this is the thing: is that you know, it's not just your processes that are important. I mean, it's um, you know your manufacturing processes rather. Um, it's also the steps and places where you get business information. And by business information, I'm talking uh, primarily about quality data on your product and also things like, um, you know, uh, predictive uh, things that allow you to predict how much product you will make in a year, all this sort of stuff. Uh, these, these things are critical business information that your front office needs to know in order to make plans and predictions on where the business are, is going. And these data really do need to be monitored. Now, in the beginning, you're going to need to work with data from your process validations and your risk assessments. Um, mainly here, I, I put it in parentheses that you need proof of your assertions. 
Well, there's two things here, you know, is that one assertion is that, yes, this thing does need to be monitored, and uh, it needs to be monitored uh, within the certain limits. And then the other assertion is, well, it does not need to be monitored, in which case, um, what have you done to show that you don't need to monitor this particular thing? Uh, gut feelings and opinions do not count here. FDA keeps telling people that you need to make science-based decisions. And um, so this, you know, requires you to develop some data. Now, in the early stages, um, you may only have things like risk assessment information based on your development work. But even in the early stages of development work, you know, you need to be doing a simple process validation to see how good your processes are and, you know, well, the initial pilot processes especially. And then from this, you can get starting information. And you can begin your SPC work uh, using this as your beginning information. Now, the other thing here is that you don't need to monitor individual steps in a process um, unless that, you know, is really critical. Uh, a lot of times what people will do is that if there's multiple steps and each one's considered to be relatively small, um, you could monitor the outcome of those steps. In other words, um, you know, you can have a, uh, say, a section of your process where you're actually uh, going to a precipitation, and then in the process of going to the pre precipitation step, you might have to do a pH adjustment, uh, stirring, all this sort of stuff for a given amount of time, and adjustment of temperatures and all this. Now, if this is true, then, yeah, you know, you don't want to monitor each one of those. And so you, you might just want to look at the outcome of the precipitation step and with the assumption that, of course, the pH adjustment, uh, controlling time of stirring, uh, even the speed of the stirrer, and other things like the temperature at which you do this, all of all of these will affect the precipitation. So you may decide not to monitor each little step that you do, rather just look at the final outcome of that step. Now, given that, um, there's two types of data that you can collect. And the subject of the previous SPC webinar was variable data and there's, there's a fundamental difference between variable data and attribute data that we're going to talk about. Now, the thing that you need to realize is that most statistical procedures are designed for variable data. And the reason is, is that variable data follow the normal distribution. Um, they form a continuum. And in a lot of ways, they're much more informative. They carry a lot more information than attribute data. However, you know, there are things that uh, where, for instance, where you're dealing with attribute data, these are discrete units. Um, things like you come to a step, you're quite, you ask a question, the answer can be yes or no. Or the answer could be like, uh, okay, you know, we want a certain color, uh, it's red, green, blue, yellow, you can have several of these attributes. It can be a pass or fail, uh, you could have high, medium, low. Uh, all of these produce can produce what are known as integer counts, in other words, whole number counts. Uh, there's no uh, one and a half, for instance. Uh, usually, you know, these are absolute uh, values. Um, for instance, while well, the classical one is that, you know, you're either pregnant or you're not. Uh, there's no partially pregnant or sort of pregnant. It's, it's one or the other. Now, the trouble here is that uh, with the problem with attribute data is that the information could actually be part of a continuum. And, um, you know, for instance, People say, well, it should be red. 
But the problem is, is that all of us have different interpretations of what red really looks like. And, you know, all you have to do is talk to the cosmetics people. And they will tell you that, you know, red is not red. There's reddish, there's scarlet, there's, you know, dark red, deep red, blood red, all of these. Or it could be pink or pinkish or brown or brownish, uh, brown, brownish, rust, tan, uh, you know, all of these. Exactly uh, what is high or medium or passing. Uh, one of the, the problems that you I see a lot of uh, in specifications, they say, uh, a, you know, you have to have a visual criterion for your product. And one of them that's often found is that white crystalline, I mean, crystalline material, uh, white to off-white. Well, you know, what the heck is off-white? Off-white can be black, for instance. Um, so you must define these things. And one of the problems with attribute data is that when there's a possibility of the thing being in a continuum, you must define these things and define them very clearly. And uh, like in the, in, well, in the case of colors, um, normally what you do is you define these uh, according to a internationally recognized color wheel. And uh, one of them I'll mention is a thing called the Pantone color wheel that's used by, well, mostly by media people, but, uh, you know, it's used by some pe the knowledgeable members of the pharmaceutical community as well. But the thing is, is that you, you really need to know, you know, what is off-white? Um, I've seen people take something that I consider to be sort of tan and uh, a little more than just off-white, and they will look at it and say, well, it's off-white, it's acceptable, you know. And uh, so th if there's no definition, um, a no clear definition, you can have a problem here. Now, there are statistical methods for dealing with attribute data. And this is caused by the fact that they may not follow a normal distribution. In fact, we're going to talk about uh, a situation where the data do not follow a normal distribution. If you have large numbers, one of the tricks is you convert the attribute data into variable data by taking fractions or percentages. And uh, I will show you, in fact, uh, this is used a lot of times with attribute data. And in what I will show you, we do use these fractions or percentages, but there's a there's a problem here, uh, which I'll mention as we go along. Mostly, if you have attribute data that is binary, binary is plus minus, yes, no, uh, something like that, um, then the data will follow a binomial distribution, and it's not attribute data is not as strong as variable data, so. A lot of times uh, when you're collecting attribute data, the regulatory or reviewers will ask you uh, for more, more replicates, uh, more, you know, more information than they would require from something where you collect uh, variable data. Now, in this discussion, we are going to talk about attribute data. Now, statistical process control, the original thing about uh, quality, and this has led to a lot of misconceptions, some of which, you know, you guys yourselves uh, use. And, for instance, the in the old days, what you did was you just made product, okay? Everybody made product. You made a lot of product in a lot of cases, and then you had 100% inspection. Now, in a small shop, the workman himself, uh, inspected the product as he made it and then decided whether it, he needed to start over again or whether it was, you know, it was of high quality or poor quality. Uh, a lot of times you had a whole bunch of um, workers who made a product and then the supervisor's job was to go around and to classify the product as of a particular worker as to whether it was bad or good. 
No, the thing about it was that bad, bad units are usually scrapped. And this led to the name quality control. The control mechanism was the sorting process. And the thing here was that, you know, in order to make bad product, it took just as long and as much effort as it took to make a good unit. Now, some people will say, oh, no, you know, good units are more expensive. It takes more tr time and trouble to make them. Well, that's true only in the sense that in the as you go along, um, the, a good workman will, will recognize when he's running into a problem, and he will throw out the bad units as he's going along. So, yeah, it does take him longer to make a good unit, but that's only because he had to dump so much um, bad product. The other thing to remember is that if you're doing this, you know, classification by inspection, 100% inspection is never 100% effective. Um, there have been many studies done by quality groups and even the American Society for Quality Control, as it was known in those days. Now it's just the ASQ. But you know, studies have been done showing that 100% inspection is never 100% effective. In fact, in some cases, it's only about 80% effective. And mainly, you know, this leads to having bad product getting through. So sometimes you have double inspections. You know, you have an inspector for the inspected product. And all of this depends upon the inspector doing a good job. Now, if you have a good inspector, of course, you know, you're going to release less product because he will inspect it to very tight tolerances, whereas a sloppy inspector may release bad product, but it gets out. And, you know, you, you run into this in some companies where the sloppy inspector passes more product and is looked upon very favorably by manufacturing, whereas the good inspector does not pass so much bad product and you know is hated by the manufacturing people for being too stringent um, from the point of view of the company and from the point of view of the worker you have a major problem here and so the the thing that came about was that the the concept that the idea here is that you don't make bad product. And this started in the late 1920s. You know, this thing is still working its way into American manufacturing. Uh, you would have thought that this, this sort of idea w would have come in almost automatically, but uh, it did not. And we have names like Walter Schuhart, W. Edwards Deming, Joseph Duran. Uh, associated basically with the idea that making scrap is not cost effective. That it just doesn't make sense to produce bad product along with good product. You know, you where you don't care what the workman is making, uh, you just say make product and, uh, and then later on you sort out the bad stuff. So the early people in quality control said that, you know, the idea is you don't make bad product. Making good product in uh, Crosby's uh, terminology, you know, do it right the first time. Don't make make product over and over again. And the conclusion came down to the idea that scrap is the result of excessive variation, uh, variation in the product. You can't make uniform product all the time, and it's and that's what causes the um, manufacturing of scrap. Now, the variation comes in two forms, and uh, Schuhart deming terminology, he, they recognize common cause variation and assignable cause variations. Now, common cause and assignable causes result uh, from sl two slightly different uh, effects in your process. Assignable cause is really also, it's also known as special cause variation. Uh, it results from unusual situations. They're not built in as part of the process. And um, because they come from unusual events, uh, usually you can detect assignable cause variation by uh, looking at your system very carefully. 
uh, in fact, the idea here is that isonomal cause is unusual enough that it can be detected and eliminated by the workers themselves. And um, usually management action is not required unless you have one of these really, uh, well, a manager who's a control freak, for instance, who has to be consulted on everything. Uh, that person may not allow you to <clears throat> act upon an obvious assignable cause variation. And, um, but normally, you know, if you have an assignable cause effect, um, line workers can detect, detect it and figure out how to fix it. Now, in most cases, OOS test results, auto specification test results, are the result of assignable cause variation. You know, it, it's a one-time thing. And, and this, of course, is a problem because in a lot of OOS investigations and OOS work, there's an assumption made that you're dealing with a recurring problem. But it may easily be a one-time thing that does not reoccur for a, for a fair amount of time. And this causes all kinds of problems during an OOS investigation and in interpreting what's going on uh, in that investigation. Now, common cause variation is sort of built into the process. It's inherent in the process. Um, it's really, it's a sum of small individual sources of variations. For instance, if you have a step, okay, that uh, again, we'll go back to the precipitation step and we say, okay, uh, you need to stir this tank for, say, 15 minutes before putting the stuff through a centrifuge. You know, this allows the crystals to grow or the precipitate to sort of digest and to grow in size so that it'll come out well in the centrifuge. And then it has to be done at a certain temperature and at a certain pH. Now, for instance, when you adjust the pH, a lot of times the worker, even though he's told to go to 7.1, um, actually they don't quite hit 7.1. It might be a little short, you know, it might be 7.08 instead of 7.10 or it might be 7.12 instead of 7.10. Uh, you know, these are little variations. And then the temperature, you know, you might say stir at 25C, but the actual temperature might be 24C or it might be 26C. And, um, you know, all of this goes on. And simultaneously in some cases, and this may cause the result of your precipitation step, i.e. I. the amount of product you collect at that step, uh, could be affected, you know, in small amounts. And from one lot to the next, depending upon who's working on it, how they're feeling. Uh, in fact, sometimes the reagents themselves can vary. And um, all of this can affect the outcome of the product. And so you will get a sort of a background variation in the process. And this is what it's known as common cause variation. And normally you cannot fix common cause variation without changing the process itself. And this is why people will tell you that in order to affect common cause variation, you must have management action. So, um, and, and this is one of the problems is that if you have management that won't take action, then it's almost impossible to remove common cause variation. Now, there is, there is a time, for instance, where common cause variation will lead to what appears to be assignable cause variation. And the problem here is this, and, uh, Excuse me a second here. I got a Oh, excuse me. I have to cough there. Uh, but basically what will happen is that the all the bad things can happen all at once. For instance, um 
the pH being slightly too low happens at a time when the temperature is slightly too high and where you stir for slightly too short a time. All three of these can happen together, in which case that particular step will have a low yield. And, um, and it may look like an OOS situation from an assignable cause, but actually it's, it's a case of the um, common cause variations, the individual variations coming together all in the wrong form. Now this is statistically, this is calcu calculable. You can come out with a calculation that says that, well, this will happen 0.01% of the time. And, uh, you know, and so when it happens, you deal with that. And the thing is that what you will find is that this will not reoccur for a long time because it's an unusual event. But at the same time, you know, there, there's a conceptual problem here in dealing with OOS uh, situations in that people insist that it must be a recurring problem that uh, is a frequent cause, and so you look for a, something that um, happens all the time when it may not, and uh, spend a lot of time in meetings this way. Now, what what we're dealing with here in statistical process control (SPC) is we're looking for assignable cause variation against a background of common cause variation, and um, you know, you're monitoring common cause. And the problem here is that if your common cause starts to vary itself or it suddenly amplifies, in other words, um, you know, you set your specs based on common cause variation. Uh, wise people set their specs according to what their process can give them. And so you, it's basically within the limits established by common cause variation. So if you suddenly get something that's out of spec, it, there's sort of an assumption that the common, something unusual has happened. And SBC charts will allow you to pick this up very easily. Now, here is what is known as a capable process. Now. Okay, we're going through time. Here's the upper control limit for a product, and this line here would be the lower control limit for that same product. And we're producing lots, and here's three lots, and their, their distribution for this characteristic. The distribution of product uh, follows a bell-shaped curve, and we find that, you know, the distribution is fairly tight so that your specs out here are, say, three or, well, in some cases, what we're going for is six standard deviations wide. 99.999% um, of your product falls within the specs. And <clears throat> there's this little tail out here, but, you know, you're you're not too concerned, and so basically you say you get a hundred percent yield all the time, and our product we know the characteristics of our product. Now here's some lots where again we know the characteristics of the product, but in this case we have a process that is producing five percent or maybe ten percent, but this well this looks more like five percent. 5% of product that is exceeding the upper uh, limit. But notice this, because the distribution is constant, in other words, the process is reprodu highly reproducible, we know that every time a, pr a lot is produced, that 5% of the product is not acceptable. And so by inspection or sorting, we can get rid of this unacceptable amount. Now, in true quality control work, they will tell you that this is unacceptable itself. Um, what you need to do is you need to try and get to this distribution down here rather than this distribution. This is where you, for instance, go from a plus or minus three sigma process and you try to get to a six sigma process. 
and which would be this one down here. But the point I'm trying to make here is that when you have a capable process, the distribution curve is constant. It always looks the same over time. And this allows you to predict how much product you're going to make. If you always know you, you're going to lose 5% of your product, and you know this for a fact, you can build into your predictions for the future exactly build that in and you know how much product you will have the thing you don't want to get is this situation with an unstable process now here's the midline okay this is what we're, this is where we want our average product the peak of our product to be and we have here the first lot that looks pretty good you know, this could be, say, your demonstration lot or your the, the first time you make the product, everything looks good. But because the process is unstable, as you go through time, you find that the average member of the population um, actually shifts in, in terms of its... Uh, well, not acceptability, notice this, but in terms of its pro um, characteristics, it shifts. Now, maybe out here, you start to get more scrap that you have to throw out. Uh, but here, yeah, you, you know, it's an odd distribution, but it's pretty much acceptable. And here, you might get a tail to the low end of your spec, and you would lose product there. <coughs> but the process here is unpredictable. You don't know how much product you're going to make in the future. Uh, you don't know how your process is running out into the future. And once again, excuse me. Oh, it seems like I'm being attacked by something here in my office. Um, okay, so with attribute data, we're looking, say, say um, we're going to take a review of batch records as an example here. Now, in the case of batch record reviews, what you're looking at here is that you look at individual lines in the batch record and you say, has this been properly executed? Um, you know, in a lot of cases, you find batch records where people have skipped the filling out of lines uh, in or they haven't initialed the entry, they haven't dated the entry, there's no counter signature to the entry. Uh, all of these things, or they've actually calculated something and then initialed it and dated it, but the calculation is wrong. So when you do your batch record reviews, you know, you're looking for this sort of thing. And, and so, but it's binary in the sense that the question you ask is, was this line properly filled out? And your answer is a yes or no answer. So that takes you into attribute data. Now, <clears throat> one solution here, as we mentioned earlier, you count all of your nonconformities. Now, this is where nonconformities may occur in the batch record. And you divide this number into the number actually observed. Uh, and this is treated then as a single point. Uh, this should be datum, which is singular. Of course, I don't know. If you went to high school in California, I guess you don't know the difference. But anyway, it's a single point. And there's really no average here. And each batch record is considered to be a discrete unit. So now, with single point data, you can't use the usual SPC procedures. There's no averages and no ranges of the types that you normally use. So you have to go to these procedures for attribute data. Um, there's a problem here if you have too few nonconformities. And <clears throat> this, is, this is the problem where you get the average range of the count uh, being one or less. And um, for instance, you, you have um, a situation where most of your batch records are co correctly executed. In other words, 
all of the lines are properly filled out. And this happens, you know, say you, you get a run of four that are properly filled out and then you get one Oh, excuse me again, one that is not properly filled out, and and this is repeatable over time. So your average uh, number of nonconformities is actually 0.2, much less than one. And um, what you find here is that um, your average is small, and as a result, your range chart becomes unnecessarily narrow and you generate OOS results uh, just by statistical effects alone. Now the recommendation here is that you want to create a situation where you average two or more counts per unit. And um, <clears throat> excuse, excuse me again here. Oh, I need to take a drink of water. So the, the problem here is that if you're averaging less than two counts per unit, uh, or actually less than 1.5 uh, counts per unit, then you can probably get away with not doing an SPC, uh, mainly because you know you can pretty much argue that there, there's not in, there's not enough of a problem to be running SPC on it. It's when you get to two or more per unit that you really want to be looking at this thing. <clears throat> now, for in the case of batch records, for instance, you can get batch records from previous runs and you can start with as few as three. But uh, remember, more is better, uh, 20 is preferred, and uh, if you start with a small number as you go along, for instance, if you start with three, you can say that, okay, when we get to five, we will readjust the parameters. Uh, when we get to 10, we will readjust again. We will readjust at 15, and then at 20, we will readjust. And, <clears throat> you know, as you progress with your product development, you will then have more lots. Um, that allow you to set your SPC parameters, mainly the the average and the um, the range for the answers. Now, you know, as part of your your annual product review, you should evaluate the SPC chart limits to see if they really are appropriate or are they giving you problems just because they're not properly set or that they were set with the, based on the wrong assumptions. Now, we then go forward here. For each batch record, you take a count of the nonconformities and divide it by potential nonconformities. Okay, now, what, what have we here? Say you have 50 lines in a thing. You that's your total potential nonconformities. And then you take the batch record and you look into it and you say, well, you know, we have five lines where there's a nonconformity. So we divide this by the, the potential nonconformities, which is 50, and you get a value x. In this case, it would be 0.1. And this Point one then becomes your va your value x that you then use. You know you've got three three batch records. You've got five batch records to start with. You calculate an average x. So here's x average uh, of the counts, and you use this in calculating your center line for your SPC chart. Now. <clears throat> You calculate ranges based on sequential subgroups or pairs of results. Uh, in this case, we're saying subgroups of two. Uh, people have gone to as many as subgroups of five, but in the beginning, that's all you, you may have is two or three um, 
subgroups. So you know you you may have problems uh, grouping these things. But from this, you can calculate the average range from your set of se sequential ranges. And this becomes R bar, which is the center line of your range chart. Now, the problem here is that the sequential ranges and the sequential you know, readings have to be completely independent of each other. Now notice this, because your range is calculated from the, from the averages for two sequential points, um, if the averages are not independent of each other, completely independent, you're going to get a couple situation. In other words, um, you get a non-random situation. And to be perfectly honest, and we'll see this as we go along, when you use two couple sets of information, two uh, paired or sequential subunits, um, <clears throat> it's almost inevitable that you're going to get coupled values. And uh, we'll show you that later. Now, the, the upper and lower limits for the fractional counts, you set this by using a constant known as D2. Now, there's a, uh, basically you're converting this into a standard deviation. And there are tables of SPC constants. These were, you know, many of them were originally published by Walter Schuhart uh, back in the old days. And these constants are known as A2, D2, D3, D4. And there's some other constants, but um, you know you will recognize this as A's and D's mainly. There will be tables. Most statistics books that cover SPC will have this table in them. In fact, they should. Um, <clears throat> and then what you get are what are known as natural process limits. Uh, they're set using the actual data from the process that you're running. So, you know, in some cases, you have uh, artificial limits that are set up ahead of time as to what is acceptable product. But in this case, we're, we're setting up your limits based on what the process itself can give you. Now, with single counts, um, here's a the limits for an X reading. Your X bar value, you know, this is the average X that we have calculated. And the upper natural process limit for X is three times your average range divided by D2. And in this case, uh, we're doing two uh, sequential readings. So D2 is equal. <laughs> oh, excuse me, I got attacked again. Um, anyway, it's the average R divided by D2 multiplied by 3. This gives you the upper natural process limit for x. Your lower limit for x is x bar minus this same, um, <clears throat> same number. Now, for the moving range, the moving range is d4. The upper control limit for the range is d4 r bar. In other words, your average r times D4. And in this case, R is, the R bar is derived from two results. So you have your subunit size is two. So your upper control for the R, upper control limit for R is 3.268, which is the value of D4 times R bar. Now, notice there's no lower control limit. And the reason is is that your, your subunit size is too small. Subunit size is only two. 
so your lower control limit is zero. Now, there, there's a problem here. I think I told you that this is D3 times R bar, and D3 has no value. D3 equals zero for subunit sizes smaller than seven. So whether you're doing variable um, SPC or attribute SPC, that subunit size prevents you from having a lower control limit on the range value. Now, if you do get to a larger size on larger number of replicates, then you can set a lower control limit, and there will be a value for D3 in the tables. Now, here's an example with single counts, okay? This is the number of errors that you find in the batch record. We have here six batch records. And we find this is your count, six, four, three, 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 two, three. And then the fraction, this fraction is set up as follows. There are 140 lines per batch record, okay? So it's six divided by 140 gives you this fraction. Four divided by 140 gives you this. Three divided by 140 gives you this. Now, you should notice something here. Because we've got attribute data, in other words, these are discrete. Notice that these numbers here, as well, the obvious one here is you look at three and you look at two errors. It's 021 and 014. There's no intermediate values here between 014 and 021, right? And because of this, you have, you know, this is the effect of having attribute data. You don't have a true continuum of your fractions here. Your R chart, your R value is, okay, it's 6, 4, and this fraction is 0, 043, 0, 029. The difference between these two gives you R. And it's an absolute difference, okay? We don't care if it's a plus or minus thing. The R value is always a positive. <clears throat> and 029, 021, we have this. Now, 2121, we have a zero for the R value. 21 going to 014 is 007. 21, again, brings you back to 007. So these are your R values. But from this, we can calculate an average X. Your X bar or your X average is 025. Your R value, your, your average R, this is now for only six values, I mean, five numbers is 007. Oh, sorry about that, another coffee break. But given the, the numbers there, we have our upper natural process limit for X is this number. Lower natural process limit for <clears throat> for X is 007. So we have these, this would be the range allowed for a value of X for any given chart. Your upper R value is 023. Your lower value is zero because again, you know, we only had two replicates. Uh, these are based on three sigma, by the way, uh, three sigma limits which was the original setup from Walter Schuhart's tables. Uh, in his day, we were looking for plus or minus three sigma. You know, nowadays we look for plus or minus six sigma, and I'm pretty sure there are tables uh, set up for plus or minus six sigma if you want to go to the, those limits. Now for binomial counts, um, you see, now here's the, here's the catch. What we just did was we converted the data into decimal fractions so that we could work with them. Even, even though the decimal fractions themselves 
still showed the effects of the attribute nature of the data. Now, one thing we'll point out is that if you have large numbers, uh, really large numbers, then the attribute data becomes sort of like variable data. In other words, the fractions become, you know, uh, <clears throat> you don't have large jumps. You don't go from 014 to 007. You would have intermediate numbers uh, possible. And when that happens, that's where your attribute, your binomial distribution merges into the normal distribution. Now, <clears throat> there's a problem sometimes uh, when people are looking at attribute data. They don't want to convert them into fractions. They want to just deal with them as attributes. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we can go back to the... Uh, batch records again, and we're trying to monitor, in this case, we want to monitor individual lines and classify them on a pass-fail basis. And, uh, you know, this could be just something as the presence or absence of a signature. For instance, in one line, um, you can have several things that could go wrong with that line. So you could monitor it for different properties. For instance, is it filled out? Is there a number entered? Was there an initial place next to the entry? Was a counter signature included? Was the date included? And you can classify all of these on a pass-fail basis. So one line, for instance, can have like four different attributes um, related to it. But because you're only classifying it on a pass-fail basis, uh, you have four different counts here. Now, <clears throat> you, this creates a binomial distribution. And only when the numbers get very large does the binomial merge into the normal distribution. Now, the thing here is that if you have a relatively small numbers, the problem you're dealing with is with what is known the, as the area of opportunity. The area of opportunity places limits on the possible results. Now, <clears throat> okay, remember this. If you're dealing with variable data, in theory, there is an infinite number of variable points that can come up. I mean, you know, in te technically between, for instance, 0 and 1, there is an infinity of fractional numbers. And so the, um, the area of opportunity is very large. But if you're dealing with the attribute data, then you actually have a relatively small area of opportunity, and this creates limits. Uh, in terms of the possible results, and we'll, we'll show you this here. Now, the batch record contains 50 lines where an entry must be made. And like I say, you know, each line is then conform as classified as conforming or non-conforming. And for instance, um, well, in the situation we just talked about, there were four possible points that could be filled out. So actually, this thing, you know, if, if we had a 40-line or a 40-line uh, document, actually, there might only be 10 lines, but there's 40 places where it can be filled out, right? So it, that count would be here. Now, <clears throat> in this case, we have y. We define y as the actual number of nonconformances conformances in a batch record. And in this case, y can be any integral number or integer number between 0 and 50, OK? Because there's only 50 lines in this batch record. So y cannot be less than 0 or greater than 50. And this is known as the area of opportunity. 
in other words, it's the area of the, the, where there's an opportunity for a mistake or a failure. So in this particular case, our area of opportunity is only 50. It's not infinitely large. Now, under certain conditions, the value of y is considered to be binomially distributed. And the, in this case, the area of opportunity must consist of n distinct items. Now, in a batch record, this is convenient. The n distinct items are n individual lines or n individual points of entry. <clears throat> now, each of the n terms items must be classified as either possessing or not possessing the attribute, you know, and giving you a pass fail or something like that. And so we say y is the count of items possessing the attribute. Now, the occurrence of an item possessing the attribute must be independent of whether or not the preceding item did or did not possess the attribute. In other words, no coupling. Um, and, th and this actually is kind of difficult. Um, to effect, uh, for instance, weather weather data are always coupled. Um, weather data in the sense of, say, the the ground temperature. Um, if yesterday was hot, the probability is higher that today will also be hot. And if the preceding day was cold, then the probability is that the current day would be cold. Or colder than normal and the same way you know you with the hot <clears throat> now in this case we say y average is equal to a value called n times p prime um, now when we're setting up our charts you know we have our previous uh, batch records for instance so, suppose we start off with 10 batch records now, n would be the total number of items, the area of opportunity. Well, if we have 50 lines per batch record and we have, we have 10 batch records, then n is 500 in this case. P is the proportion of all non-conforming items. Well, if the average value, this P prime would be the number of non-conforming items that we have seen, and we multiply that times the total number of items. <coughs> now here's the thing, P prime, this, this is a proportion, it's not a count. So <coughs> the average proportion here, um, would be that on average, well, say we see five non-conformances within the 50 lines. So in this case, P is 0.5. <clears throat> no, I'll take that back. P is 5 over 50, okay? So it's 0.1. And so it's P times N, which was 500, 0.1 times 500, um, gives you the average, Y average, which is the number of non-conformances. <clears throat> okay, I screwed that up. Let, let me back this up. Um, okay, N is the area of opportunity per batch record. And it's not 500, it's 50. P is the proportion, the average number of non-conforming items per batch record. In this case, we said it's <clears throat> 0.1. So N times P, the average Y is 5. Okay, it's 0.1 times 50, your area of opportunity. And in this case, the average number of non-conformances is 5. Uh, sorry I screwed that up, but I, I don't know. My voice is giving me problems and 
a little distracting. Okay, so anyway, we we establish what y average is. Now, y average then gets plotted. Okay. <clears throat> now, what we're going to see is that this p prime is actually a theoretical number. Uh, it comes from a large population, and if you've been manufacturing product for years, making many lots per, per, per year, then the baseline that you have for calculating this thing would actually be equal to P prime. But normally uh, what it is is that you don't have this huge number. So you estimate your P prime by calculating P average. And P average is from based on your preceding batches. On, and this is how you set your, your baseline. Now, this goes back. This is the number of non-conforming in all subgroups. So if we said that we had five per batch record, okay, one batch record is a subgroup, okay? And so <clears throat> we said, we have a number of non, we had five per batch, so that's 50. And in this case, it's the sum of the N of the area of opportunities for all subgroups. Well, we have 10 subgroups, so N is equal to 500 because each subgroup had 50. Okay, N was 50 for each subgroup, and we had 10 subgroups, so now N is five. This denominator here is 500. And we had five <clears throat> per subgroup, but we had 10 subgroups, so this is 50. And again, P average is 0.1, okay? And we take that back here, and we say, now, Y average is equal to N, your area of opportunity, times P average. P average was 0.1, N is 50, so Y average is 5. And the standard deviation for normal distribution is calculated from this same value, except here it's shown as P prime. But in reality, what you will deal with is a P average. So you can substitute this P prime with P average to get your real number. And the standard deviation is the square root of n times p average times 1 minus p average. So this gives you the standard deviation for your chart. So here, here we have y average, which is the center line, and we have the standard deviation. And so now we set up our upper control limits, and the NP stands for natural process is n times p average plus three, three times the standard deviation, okay, or minus three times the standard deviation. And here's the center line for your chart. We're not even gonna talk about an R value here because <clears throat> it, the, the number of subgroup, well, we only are comparing one to the other, so n equals two for the number of subgroups that we're setting up our R value with. And, uh, you know, it's really not so good. So we're only gonna really look at the Y average here. Now here's a condition, uh, rejected number of rejected lines per batch record. You have 60 lines per batch record. They're all checked and classified as conforming or non-conforming. Y is the count of non-conforming lines in each batch record. And we start with 21 batch records collected from previous runs. And then this, here's our, you know, our example here. Now, here's the data. Here's the record, the, the batch records. We have 21 batch records. And here's the number of non-conformances found in each batch record, okay? 
Batch record number 10 had 24 non-conformances. With batch record number 8 wasn't so great, it had 42. Now the total number of lines here is 60 times 21, right? 60 per batch record times 21 batch record. So we have 1,260 batch lines. And in this case, we have the area of opportunity was 60. And it's times the number of batch records that we have. And now we have the sum of the non-conformances. If we take these Y values and sum them up for 21 batch records, we get 467. So we calculate our P average as 467 divided by 1260 is equal to 0 0.3706. We use this. Here's our center line. It's 0 0.3706. This is your, <clears throat> your P average times N, which is your area of opportunity, is equal to 22.2. We then take the same data. We calculate the upper control limit here. and your lower control limit can be calculated in the same way. Um, the difference here is that for the lower control limit, instead of plus 11.2, we would have minus 11.2. So we have this for the upper and lower control limits. So here's our chart, our NP chart. And this plots our 21 batch, batches or, well, in this case, batch records. And here's the 42. Remember that whole thing? Um, it sticks out, and this was our upper control limit. So very clearly, in this case, we've exceeded it. We've got an OOS. And over here, we see a situation where we're, we're kind of coming up to the upper control limit, and we're kind of bouncing around near it. At this point, we would want to monitor this much more carefully. In other words, what this is kind of telling us is that maybe people are getting sloppy in filling out the batch records. Maybe we have a new supervisor uh, who's not supervising so carefully, and the workers aren't paying a lot of attention maybe to filling out the batch records. Now, <clears throat> notice there was no R chart. And the problem here is that if we're using successive pairs, the results are coupled. And they're correlated. And the, the fact is, is that when this happens, uh, all assumptions about random statistics falls apart. And if you have no independence, uh, you really can't look at these data. So the R chart is useless. And um, here's the example. Notice here with 42, OK, the R value comparing 7 versus 8, it jumps from 16 to 42, which gives you 26. Now, when the 26, the 42 relaxes back down to a baseline type of value, which would be 18 here. Remember, the average here is 22.2. Notice that this one, this R value is also large. And this is large because this one was large. It jumped up. And so these two numbers are actually coupled. And um, <clears throat> you know, this, this is where it destroys. Um, your random value uh, idea. And you see the same sort of thing happening here when we start going back and forth from 21 to 32, back down to 22, back up to 33, and then holding at 30. Uh, the R kind of bounces around, but it's all these R values are coupled to each other. And so, in the, and this is the reason why we don't use a R chart in this case. And I do believe that uh, with that, uh, now that my clocking seems to have stopped, um, 
the webinar uh, comes to a close. And we will turn this uh, open for questions and uh, discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kuwara, for the wonderful presentation. I also thank all our participants for cooperating with us. It's time now for the Q&A to begin, and we request all who have questions for our presenter to click on the raise hand option, which is a palm-like icon at the bottom of your participants panel, uh, for you to go ahead and ask your questions verbally. Uh, you can also go ahead and post your questions on the Q&A panel, or uh, you can go ahead and post it on the chat box, and I can pass it on to our speaker to uh, read it out loud and then answer the same. Well, meanwhile, uh, we sincerely request you to uh, share your feedback with us in the feedback form that will appear on your polling panel right now. The feedback form has about eight questions, mostly multiple choice of nature, and wouldn't take more than two minutes of your time to answer. The polling will remain open till the end of the session, and you can answer it even after the Q&A uh, is, is over. Yes, now let, let me also point out that um, you know, well, I don't I don't know how it works with you, but what what happens with me a lot of times is that after we get through with the session, and uh, you know, like ten minutes afterwards, uh, as I'm back in my office or I've gone back to whatever I was doing, then a question arises, and uh, you you think to yourself, geez, I should have asked that question during the session, didn't get a chance. And at which time I will tell you, please feel free to send a question in to us. And uh, Johnson and his people will make sure that uh, the question is routed to me. And I will respond to it um, as soon as is, well, as soon as convenient, let's put it that way. And so, uh, you know, even though you don't ask a question right now, you should know that you will have a chance to uh, to ask these questions in the future. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor. Uh, well, we do have uh, one question that's come up. Um, let me quickly go ahead and send it to you. Okay. Yeah, that should come on your screen right now. Okay, let me see. Um, slide let 19. Me go back. Oh, yeah. how did I decide to I'll use D4? Yes, I shall go back. Yes. Okay. Yes, um, okay, this D4. Now, D4 is a value in the table. And you use D4 to calculate your upper control limit for your moving range. Uh, that's sort of just set for you. And in this case, the D4 value is based on a subunit size of two. There are two numbers that are used here to generate your R value. Now, if your R value was generated, say, from a uh, standard deviation, where you actually included three or four results, then it would be based on either three or four. In this case, the subunit size was two. Uh, we go into the D4 table, which is, as you know, based on three standard deviations. And we look under subunit size two, and we get a value of D4 for 3.268, and this is multiplied then by the average, the R bar, the average range that we've calculated uh, from the earlier data. And that's basically how we decide to use uh, this particular value of D4. But basically the rule is for upper control limits, you use D4. For the lower control unit limit, you would have used D3. It's a little bit different, um, you know, when you're setting your, um, control limits for the averages or for the you know the center line those values are given as plus or minus the same calculation 
Whereas when you're working with the R values, uh, whether it's upper control limit or the lower control limit, uh, these are two different constants. And this is why you can have an upper control limit in this case with a lower control limit set at zero. Hope that answers the question. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kawara. Well, uh, we are uh, waiting. Uh, while we're waiting for some more questions to come up, I just wanted to inform all our participants uh, that in case your colleagues, team members, friends might benefit from this webinar, we are happy to inform you that it would be available in a recorded format and can be purchased from our website. Or you can also call us at 1-800-447-9407. On your screen right now, um, we have a couple of more uh, webinars that have been scheduled uh, from uh, uh, by Dr. Kawara, one uh, next month and the following month. And also to let uh, all our participants know, uh, we do have a library of recorded webinars from Dr. Kawara, and uh, you can also visit our website at www.globalcompliance.com. Uh, for you to get more information on the same. Well, uh, Doctor, I don't see any more questions coming in. Any parting words, thoughts before we close today's session? No, uh, I've... I'm going to make a presentation in Philadelphia in about a week uh, that will cover material very similar to what I've covered in this session and the previous session, but we will have more time, obviously, for discussions and things. So if anybody's interested, I'm sure they'll be glad to take any last-minute registrants. Um, but I hope I can these these webinars encourage you to use SPC in your work, especially for those of you in QC. You know, um, what FDA has come up with, for instance, in process validations, they say at phase three or your step three in process validation, they want to see you doing continuous process verification. And one of the ways you can do this is by monitoring your processes using SPC charts. Uh, similarly, with your analytical procedures or your test methods, you should monitor the test methods using a SPC chart, uh, monitoring your control values, the values you get from your controls. And basically, if you do this, um, it gives you grounds for arguing that your process, you know, if, if everything continues to look good on your SPC charts, and you can show this, it gives you grounds for saying that, well, you know, my process hasn't changed that much. My test method hasn't changed that much. And so rather than doing a full revalidation, we will, uh, we will do only a limited uh, revalidation. We'll look at certain characteristics uh, that may have changed, and uh, you know. But as far as we can tell, our process is very stable. Remember, process and method, uh, test method and manufacturing process are basically, from the point of view of quality, they're both processes. So. Um, <clears throat> It's a useful tool to know, and I think in the future we're going to be using it uh, much more frequently. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kuwara. Well, as as Dr. Kuwara mentioned a little while earlier, uh, we do have a live two-day in-person seminar that's scheduled to go uh, on the 23rd and 24th of May uh, in 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 Philadelphia. Uh, the topic is statistical process control for process development and validation. It's a two-day seminar, 
at the Philadelphia. You can get more information if you log on to our website, which is www.globalcompliancepanel.com. And like uh, Dr. Kumara said a little while earlier, in case you do have any questions, queries that uh, might arise after this uh, session, please feel free to write into us at webinars at globalcompliancepanel.com and we can get that answered at the earliest. Now, we welcome your suggestions and feedback or ideas on how we can improve our webinars. If you'd like to suggest a topic or desire a customized corporate training online or on site, uh, we ensure that whatever your training necessity is, it would be our priority. We look forward to having you with us again sometime soon and for your continued patronage. On behalf of our presenter, Dr. Stephen Kuara, and the Global Compliance Panel team, I would like to say thank you for participating in today's webinar, and we wish you a pleasant day ahead. Thank you.